We have a wonderful panel uh, on theme seven for the conference. That theme is conservation. I will introduce the names of the panellists and I'll do a little bit of a biog just before they speak. Um, so our current conservation panel will consist of um, Professor Jean-Marc Hero um, from Griffith University, Dr Wade Hadwin from the School of Environment, Griffith University, and uh, the first speaker in this conservation panel will be Professor Catherine Pickering from the School of Environment, Griffith University. And a short biog on Catherine, I pick the eyes out of her history, which is very, very deep and rich. 25 years researching experiences in ecology, the impacts of climate change on biodiversity in Australia. She's a world leader in recreation ecology assessing the impacts of tourism and recreational use on natural ecosystems. And certainly, as the Save Our Spit president, I'm really keen to hear what Professor Catherine Pickering has to say. Thank you. Do you want a word or are you happy to stay at the podium and talk I'll to do it? Thank you. <laughs> We're under very clear instructions where to stay focused and stay close to the mark. So, unfortunately, won't have us wandering around as much as we do. So, the way we're doing it today is I'll start off talking about plants, then Mark's talking about animals, and Wade is going to be talking about aquatic systems. So I'm going to be talking about the benefits of going local in our gardens, which is a follow-on from some of the stuff that Jerry Corby Williams was talking about, um, but a focus on in some, not so much food production, but conservation via our gardens. So we're incredibly lucky as we have every day and we wander out in our natural environment just how stunning and diverse our flora is. And it's really easy as Queenslanders to sometimes forget just how wildly incredible it is. So in southeast Queensland, there are over 3,200 species and on the Gold Coast, there are about 1,670 species of native plants. To give you a scale, that's more than Great Britain. So we have, on the Gold Coast, more different types of plants than Great Britain to choose from and to appreciate and use in our gardens. And as you can see, they occur in a wide range of um, environments from the dunes to the rainforests. So we also have plants adapted to a wide diversity of environmental conditions. And we're going to, at Griffith, what we're doing is we're trying to promote the use of local plants in our gardens. And there are a whole lot of really good use reasons for this. First of all, they are adapted to the climates and soils. They've got a whole range of adaptations to a whole range of different local environmental conditions. They also, of course, provide habitat for wildlife. So if you plant native plants, you also attract and feed a whole lot of animals and stunning birds, butterflies, etc. You're also contributing to conserving the local flora. And a really, really important thing is they're less likely to become weeds. And with climate change, that's particularly important. Unfortunately, a huge number of weeds in Australia are actual garden escapees. So they're, they're beautiful plants we've brought in from overseas, go well in our gardens, jump the fence, run wild. And a lot of our major weeds on the Gold Coast, particularly a lot of the weed vines, are some of those really attractive plants that we once had growing in our gardens. If you grow local southeast Queensland plants, you have less risk that they're going to go turn into a problem in the local environment. It's also about a sense of place. We live on the Gold Coast. Let's celebrate this location and have that attachment and sense of where we belong. And hey, they're pretty damn beautiful. Um, as you can see, the largest terrestrial orchid in Australia is there. That's one of the plants that's native to our local swamps um, on South Stradbroke and North Stradbroke Island. How stunning is that? Now, in specifics, Planting local plants will help deal with climate change. And the reason for this is that it increases the resilience of natural ecosystems. If we, main, if we reduce the spread of weeds, we maintain and restore natural ecosystems. It increases the habitat available for flora and fauna to deal with the impacts of climate change. And as I mentioned, fewer weeds. But more specifically, three of the predictions for the Gold Coast for climate change are extreme heat events. And we just heard this morning again about how although we get very focused on the death rates, and they are horrific, associated with cyclones, flooding and bushfires, more people die in heat events and heat waves than from bushfires or cyclones in Australia. And one of the things we can do is if we start planting more trees in our streets and in our gardens and in our parks, we actually can offset the impacts of increased temperature 
and reduce the chances of, of um, do a whole lot of environmental benefit, reduce costs of air conditioning, et cetera, but naturally cool the environment. Second one is extreme rainfall and flooding, which we've, of course, recently experienced, and, you know, that's the new norm. And planting the plants and gardens and streets help re um, with trees and maintaining native vegetation and re-greening does amazing things in terms of reducing runoff. And we also had that again, it's fabulous coming after Jerry, because he made some of those points about just how much water gets absorbed by soil and vegetation compared to hard surfaces. When we harden up all of our city, we dramatically increase the risk of flash flooding. If we maintain our wetlands, if we maintain our gardens, if we have our water tanks, all of those things can reduce flooding. Maintaining, having trees and wetlands, et cetera, is a great way of dealing that. And the third major prediction is coastal erosion and flooding. And so we've already seen those well and truly, and we had that point yesterday made that having the dune, the beaches, was a way of us um, negating some of the impact of the um, huge wave fronts coming into the city. When we have those dunes that we're pumping sand out, but we can keep more of that sand there when we maintain our dunes. So that's another thing that's really important. Also, mangroves and wetlands will offset storm flooding, etc. Now, there are good books about native plants, but there are fewer garden books. So we've got ones about what the native plants are, but we don't have so many telling you how you can garden with natives. And so what we're doing at Griffith is trying to deal with some of these limitations. And I'm just going to quickly go through some of the stuff we're doing. So we have new campus planting strategy and for the garden. So I'm now involved as the landscape consultant for the campuses and particularly for the Gold Coast. And we've dramatically increased the diversity of native plants from southeast Queensland that we're using on the campus. So while you're here, please take the chance to have a look at it. And at lunchtime, I'll be doing the third of a tours that I've been doing for this conference of the rare and threatened plant walk on campus. So go and have a look at the stunning plants. We also have a free app, and there's a handout about that called Grows at Griffith. We have red zones I'll talk about, the beach care program, and my new exciting app. Okay, so Grows at Griffith, free app now, available free, 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 smartphones, tablets, Android, Google, technology. You can use this to download to your phone. You can use it to identify 300 native plants growing across our campuses. Got some absolutely not only stunning images. If you just want to have some beautiful photos of Australian native plants, they're there on that app, available now, downloaded 6,000 times already, being used by local schools, being used by local councils, etc. We've got a rare and threatened walk, which is the walk I've been taking people on, and I'll be running that at lunchtime. You can come along and you can use um, QR codes, scan the signs, up pops a virtual version of me talking about the plants, but today you get the live version. You see the, well, it's not flower at the moment, but Phaeus, you'll hear about the rarest um, olives in the world, and you'll get to see these stunning bottle trees. We've got two of the Ormeo bottle trees out the front of the building, so we've got um, Ormeo 1 and Ormeo 2, as opposed to B1 and B2, sitting there for you if you want to take a photo with an endangered bottle tree. Come and find out about those. We have the beach care program via coastal management, and I'll be talking about that in the workshop today as a way of people volunteering to actively do things to help restore our dunes and protect the um, Gold Coast from flooding and storm events and a great way of meeting people. They actually now, beach care programs, have meet your new partner. partner. No using technology and grinder or any of those things. You can do it at beach care. Which, whatever sexual orientation, whatever the thing, have a common interest with somebody else, meet them at beach care. <laughs> and now we've got funding from the Queensland Government to produce a new app. And we're doing this with Natura Pacific, which is a social responsibility environmental company. And they have just won the United Nations Sustainable Business Award this year in Australia against companies like Telstra. So we're incredibly happy to to collaborate with them. They've been running for 10 years, established by a former student of ours, and what they're doing is we're collaborating with them. They're producing content about plants, and we're going to produce that into an app. So what is it? It's an app for gardeners, landscapers, anyone who loves to plant. And in this case, we're not only producing an app version, we're producing a website for those of you who don't want to do apps. 
It's going to have images of 300 plants and it's going to have information about all of these native plants that are in cult native plants from southeast Queensland in cultivation. So size, water saving, bird attracting, what soil type, how big, etc. You can insert there and you can say, okay, I'll choose by plant name. You can sit there, I'm going to choose by characteristic. I want a plant to shrub to two metres with red flowers. But you can also say, I want a particular garden style, and I'll show you how that works. Or you can put in your postcode, say you're an acreage, and it will tell you what were the original um, broad vegetation groups and which species belonged to those if you want to start restoring your, the native vegetation on your property. All this in your hand, in a smartphone. Hey, we love this stuff. So these are the garden styles. You can have tropical Balinese, English cottage, Austral Mediterranean, formal Tuscan, native rainforest, minimalist architectural, personal nature refuge, coastal Australian desert, birds and butterflies, specifically if you want to have a garden that's going to be contributing to biodiversity conservation. We're also going to have two Griffith landscaping collections. One, a formal one that we've used in the front entrances to the, um, built the um, university, and another one which we think is a really good combo of species based on our experience for an urban garden. Kids' garden, native meadow. And as you can see, these sort of gardens can look stunning with natives. And that's it. I think we're going to have to hold off on the questions, though. Or uh, we... In the workshop, because yes. you've just attracted so many people <laughs> to your workshop, they can ask questions, and now the competition's hot. Okay, Mark, to got to beat that one. <laughs> we'll and I'm to... going to introduce you, so step aside, young man. I've done my homework on you, um, if I can find the page. Um, we've got brilliant people speaking here today, and no less than Professor Jean-Marc Hero, he uh, works at Griffith University here. He's a member of the Environmental Futures Research Institute. He has a focus on conservation and biodiversity. He has a national and international reputation as a leading amphibian research scientist. Now, young man, it's all yours. Stay on camera, stay on the microphone. Thanks, uh, thanks for a great introduction. I started with frogs, but I'm now diverged into a much broader scale of things and this is really following the, the fault of Goldock, the Commonwealth Games Organising Committee, who made the mistake of inviting me to a sustainability forum. <laughs> and I sat there thinking sustainability and I've got the description there. It, it's just one of these catchwords that nobody's really doing anything. So I've come up with a, a rather grandiose idea that I'll share with you and we'll talk about in the workshop. Before I had that, though, I had this talk all prepared. I'm going to talk to you about impacts, response, solutions to climate change and how it affects terrestrial biodiversity. So let's just push through that very quickly. Brendan will be pleased because I've pissed a couple of his slides here and he, you may have seen these, yes, these yesterday. But just a reminder, we know we're here. We know why we're here. Uh, what I really want to talk about is the... And Brendan, I don't know if you spoke about this yesterday. But this is a, another one, Brendan's slide, which is uh, good for us to think back. We like to think of Indigenous culture in, and particularly Aboriginal culture in Australia. And we go back to the past. But if we go back a few more million years, we can see that these periods of, of climate change were really important for speciation events. And so many of the species that we see today are the result of a fairly recent sort of mid-Miocene uh, changes and even as, cl as close as five million years ago, most of the species that you're familiar with here are about five million years old, at least in the frog department that I know well. So there's no doubt that things are changing rapidly and we've got polar bears breeding with uh, grizzly bears, we've got polar bears disappearing and starving, we've got our first mammal species in the world that is clearly and directly linked, the extinction of which is clearly and directly linked to climate change. So this is, of course, a, an animal on a very small island, and with sea level rise and flooding events, the, the habitat's been destroyed. If you're interested, I could give a whole lecture on this, on, on the effects on biodiversity, and I really recommend this very short video. It's only 12 minutes, but I'm not allowed to show it to you today. But clearly, when we have rapid change like we're seeing, we have what we call winners and losers. CP sort of referenced them as weeds, and you might think of, of these... Uh, possums as being weeds, and certainly some people do. 
We've got a change in the environment and we've got a change in the ecosystem that supports those species. So the species on the top right, many of you will not be able to recognise because it's a greater glider. It was very common throughout the Gold Coast. The last one was seen across the road here about, I keep saying five years ago, so it's probably 10 years ago now that we, we last recorded one over there. And of course, the picture of the koala there in the tree eating the leaves is a classic example of a species that's dependent on an ecosystem and on specific food plants. So how do species persist over millions of years is all about where are our species going to go in the future? So they're either going to evolve new traits or they're going to be plastic in the traits that they already have. Now those things we can't change, that's in their DNA. They either adapt in this sense or they don't. They can retreat to refugia and that's where we start to play a game here. We can make sure that the refugia are available. Or they can disperse into favourable locations and that's critical if you're going to, if your total environment is shifting with climate, all the plants are moving up the mountains, the animals have to follow them. So I won't waste too much time with some of the detail but this picture here gives you a nice understanding of how we can see animals moving up mountains. The mountain example is nice because it's easy to see and you can see that the grey on the top on your left and mine is disappearing and the green has moved up into that high up elevation spot. So we've got changes that are, that are happening. We can demonstrate this both in altitudinal gradients and latitudinal gradients. So hopefully this video might work, but I'm not sure how I can get it to work. Oh, it's automatic. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> This is an example of the research that I'm involved in. Sorry, this is the research I'm involved We're in. currently in the midst of the sixth global extinction crisis and many species around the world are disappearing. Amphibians are one of the groups that are worst hit with over 30% of species currently threatened around the world. So what are the causes of global amphibian declines? The primary cause of decline is destruction of habitat and fragmentation, which are things that we can easily fix. However, disease and climate change are also emerging as major threats to amphibians around the world. The Environmental Futures Research Institute is working with the Griffith Climate Change Response Program to look at how amphibians are likely to respond to climate change. One of our projects is looking specifically at mountaintop endemics. These are frogs that live only on mountaintops and are at high risk from extinction due to climate change. This is because as the warmer temperatures rise on the mountain, the frog could literally be pushed off the top of the mountain. So to examine this problem is not simple, it's not easy. We have a lot of work to do to try to assess how a frog is likely to respond. The first thing we need to do is find out where the frogs are, and that requires a lot of field work. So one of my PhD students, Marielle, is out in the field searching for frogs constantly trying to find these very rare mountaintop endemics. Once Marielle finds these frogs, we then need to start looking at why they occur where they do. And the first thing to do that is to make sure that we actually detected them. So detectability and working out our probability of finding a frog is also very important. The next step is to find out what are the environmental conditions at that site which allow the frogs to survive. So we're looking at things like the maximum temperature at which a frog can survive in, the minimum temperatures at which frogs can survive. We do this using experimental labs in the field. The next thing we need to do is look at the actual temperature of the environment in which the frogs occur. And for doing that, we need to use temperature loggers. And we put these out in the environment to find out what the temperatures are like. We also need to monitor rainfall and see how that affects the response of frogs to the environment. Once we understand the thermal environment of a frog in its current environment, we can then start to examine how it's likely to respond to climate change. And the best way to do this is to use current climate change scenarios and model how current distributions are likely to change with future global warming. And this is where the Biodiversity and Climate Change Virtual Laboratory, the BCCVL, can help researchers like Mark. 
The BCCVL is an online portal which allows researchers to model climate change and biodiversity easily and quickly. The BCCVL allows researchers to run species distribution models, explore how a species relate to its current environment, and how they respond to environmental changes. It allows researchers to project future outcomes using emission scenarios and climate models. What makes the BCCVL unique is that it combines common experiment types, data sets and processing power all within the cloud. With the BCCVL, you can do your modelling without having to worry about getting access to large data sets or learning complicated statistical programming languages. Coupled with the ever-growing list of data sets, algorithms and experiments, the BCCVL enables researchers to investigate, explore and accelerate biodiversity and climate change research. To find out more, visit us at www.bccvl.org.au. Okay. So that gives you an idea of the research background that I come from. It gives you a good idea of what the BCCVL is doing here. You can access that online and play with any species you want. It's very simple and, and user-friendly, so it's really designed for any and everybody to use. But what I really want to think about today in terms of that's all the background, that's the science that's going on here at Griffith behind the scenes, along with the things that CP and Wade are going to talk about and have talked about already. But the thing I want to focus on now is what we can do, what you as, as the local community can get engaged in. And this is where I came up with the, the term sustainable biodiversity solutions to climate change. And we can look at landscape connectivity and assisted migration because those are the two key factors that we can easily engage with. So I came up with a, a new concept which I'll call the Borrowby Biodiversity Yarning Trails Partnership. It's turned into a pretty crazy idea that is, involves many partners and could very well involve everybody in this room. So my vision is to create a sustainable biodiversity legacy for the city of Gold Coast that engages local citizens so that they become global citizens with indigenous knowledge and biodiversity assets. And of course, this will help save threatened species like the ones in the picture, not just the animals on the, the most important, of course, the frog on the left, the koalas on the right, but also the plants which are important to feed these animals. And as CP said, if we plant natives, we're providing habitat for local uh, indigenous biodiversity. So the key things I'm really driving here are to create a citywide network of biodiversity yarning trails, which will enable connectivity at a city scale. Planting a million trees for biodiversity, which is a pretty crazy idea because I said we should do this before the start of the Commonwealth Games. And gold duck were going, well, well, but uh, save the last 600 for the athletes. So hopefully we will get good support from these organisations. The core values of the trails is that we're going to share indigenous knowledge and stories, but also biodiversity knowledge and the kind of knowledge that CP showed you in the new app that they're preparing. So of course the outcomes are we're going to create carbon neutral sustainable biodiversity in reality. This is plants in the ground and trails in the streets and connecting streets and houses. Uh, and I invite everybody in, on the Gold Coast to be part of it. This is the conceptual model, and, but it's important to show you because the key element, I think, of this whole idea is to use Borrowby as a messenger. And you've all heard of Borrowby, the blue koala, and everyone goes, oh, what's this blue koala all about? If you're not from the Gold Coast, you go, why is it blue? If you, it's a, it's, and it's a mascot. And a mascot is just this puppet thing that they put up and show. But what I want to turn Borrowby into is a messenger of environment and indigenous knowledge. So we can, and we can do that, and, and we're planning to do this. I'm, I've come a long way since that sustainability forum at Goldop. Okay, so that's the, the, the key outcome that, that you might be interested in is planting the first tree. Now yesterday, uh, Minister Miles was here and I was lucky to have a couple of minutes with him Talk to him about this idea and I said, I'm going to get you and Tom to plant the first tree. And he was like, whoa, whoa. He was a bit sort of stunned, he didn't know what to say, but I'll certainly be following that up shortly. <laughs> uh, they, they may have to be on opposite sides of the tree, but that's okay, that's okay, just so long as we work together. The, core fo the key focus of the plantings at, at a big scale is to tap into the millions of dollars that have been proposed for the environment and connected to the Commonwealth Games, but haven't actually been allocated 
and the $12 million that's been allocated to koala conservation, we need to get some of that to the Gold Coast. So I'll be lobbying very hard to get some of those millions into this particular project, which is the, the key conservation areas for koalas. The other concept that's really important at a city scale is the uh, critical corridors concepts, which is connecting the coast to the hinterland. And those, I think, are really important for Borrowby, the blue koala, to go and talk to his grey buddies up in the mountains. So we can use Borrowby as a tool as part of this process. OK, so we'll have where you come in is you and any organisation or local community group that you're involved with can plant a tree, take a photo of yourself planting the tree. It's automatically geo-referenced, so it goes straight into a database and bingo, it comes up on the map of the Gold Coast as another tree planted. So we can actually visualise the greening of the city. Now, can you imagine Tom Tate leading this? <laughs> you might laugh, but I've already actually mentioned this to Tom Tate in a, just a short private meeting, well, you know, at a function. But, and he's like, oh, send me, send me an email, send me an email. So uh, Tom is actually wants to be seen to be green. And this is a great way to engage him in this. And I, I think we can do it. I, I, I think we can do it, at least in this context. Just to give you a visual of how it would be seen on the ground, I, I've got a good example here, which is connecting Griffith University with the, the red zone and CP's uh, trails within the university, but linking it up to the Southport diving and swimming so that people can, all the people who are staying in the Com Games village across the road can walk through a biodiversity trail and go and see their buddies diving because apparently there's gonna be a lot of swimmers across the road from here and they're all gonna be, have nothing to do because all their stuff's in the first few days and then they've got the next few days to walk around and look, to go on, on CP's plant trail to go on some of these broader biodiversity walks. We do still have uh, koalas, surprisingly. Uh, you'll see, oh, my point is there, over here in, in this little patch of forest. And we actually had a koala on this campus here last year. I'm sure it was wondering what the hell it was doing and where the hell it was going, but and, uh, let's, let's hope it's still alive. So, and within this context, I've also got that Southport biodiversity uh, area as being a key and really critical habitat for uh, some frogs and, and crayfish and, of course, koalas. So that's the, the, the planting a million trees. The citywide network of biodiversity trails is also an important component of, the, of that and, and contributes towards the tree planting, can contribute towards the city work, citywide network of biodiversity yarning trails. These are not limited to terrestrial landscapes. They can be aquatic, so we can have trails along rivers and canals and all sorts of things. There's no limit to, to, no constraints to this. So the ultimate goal here is really sustainable, sustain, sustainability and legacy and to connect the Commonwealth Games venues, connect them with schools, so I'm, I really engage with schools and local communities to build these trails all over the city and cre create a citywide network. So that's the big vision. I need everybody who is keen to be involved in this to come to my workshop <laughs> and I'll talk to you more about it there. So CP, JMH has really put the pressure on for workshop participants and uh, the his, uh, he, but he did fail to eclipse you in the rapid fire delivery. You were 13 minutes, he was 15, so you won the score there. Um, thank you for presenting so uh, adrenaline driven, but it's helping us catch up on time for the day as well. Okay, the third in our panel, who will also be running a workshop, so the competition's hot to get workshop participants. I'd like to introduce Dr Wade Hadwin, who's from the School of Environment here at Griffith University. He's an aquatic ecologist. His research focuses on how humans and ecological systems interact uh, with the common thread of water. The water on this planet is the only water we ever got, unless a meteorite has a little bit of frozen stuff in it. It's the only water we have, so I think water is pretty important. Um, how water is used, how it's impacted upon, how it's valued and how it's managed. So please welcome um, Dr Wade Hadwin for his presentation. Okay, so I, I think I've got about two minutes for this presentation now because of CP and Mark, so we'll see how we go. 
But the message here that I want to share with you today is that everything we do is connected through water. Every decision we make involves water. So we need to consider water more often with decisions we make around climate change, but also day-to-day -day life. So hopefully I can convince you of that as we go. We know water is really critical, but we also know climate change is going to really influence our water system. So water will change in many different ways as a consequence of climate change, and it already is in many places around the world. We know we're going to get changes in the amount of rainfall, changes in when that rainfall comes, and whether it comes in a huge volume in a flood, or whether we go for long periods of time of drought. So that variability in the climate system is something we're going to have to deal with much more than we have in the past. It's also going to influence things like wildfires and soil moisture will change as a consequence of the changes in the climate system. So even the incidence of fires is really a water story because we've got a drying out climate. We know also there's going to be more pressure on our groundwater reserves. We're going to want to pump groundwater more often as we run out of surface water supply. And that takes a long time to recharge in many places. So understanding the water balance and how we manage our water resources is going to be really critical in terms of what we look like down the track. So what does this all mean for you and me? Well, we are often refer to ourselves as carbon-based life forms, but I like to think of us as water-based. We're about 65% by mass water. Water regulates all of our physiological activities. We can't live without water. And indeed, we drink between two and four litres of water every day. And in terms of the food that we eat, huge amount of water goes into producing that food. And we heard from Jerry earlier this morning about how we can change the way that we capture water off our own roofs, grow our own food, and reduce the amount of water that we're using in our irrigated agricultural sector. But if we think about how much water on any given day we each use, it's quite phenomenal and quite a challenge in many parts of the world, given the changes that we're seeing with climate change. What we need to remember is that we all sit within the water cycle. We all live within a catchment. So water flows from the headwaters through to wherever the receiving end of the catchment is, whether it's the broad water here in Gold Coast, whether it's an inland sea or a dry area. But we need to remember where we sit in that water cycle and how any activities that we partake in are going to influence the way that that water moves. And the pollutants and the, the, uh, the balance of water in that environment is really critical. So where we live influences us because of the water cycle in that local area. I want to talk a little bit about what climate change is going to do in addition to what water already does for many people around the world. We know there are many extreme events that are water-based. So either droughts, it's the absence of water, or floods or cyclones is when we have too much water arriving all in one time. And some of these stats are from UN Water, so a global initiative to capture the degree to which water is driving some of the challenges that we face in terms of sustainable development. You can see the numbers there in terms of the economic cost, but also the lives lost. You know, more than 290,000 people have died due to those, to a bit over 2,000 water-related disasters, uh, just in that six-year period from 2000 to 2006. And then if we turn our attention to drought, that affects more than 2 billion people uh, in that same time frame. <clears throat> so on a global scale, water drives so much of how we're going. There's also an imbalance in terms of how much water there is and how much food production we need to drive. Uh, we live on a blue planet, so sure, there's 70% of our planet is water, but only about 1% of that is readily available and accessible for us to use. So we're talking about a very small fraction of water that's available for us for our production of food. We also know that water use has been growing at an incredible rate, and Jerry also spoke about this in his talk today, saying how much water use is looking like uh, growing. Even in areas where population is not growing hugely, we tend to use more and more water with our processes all the time. By 2025, which is, as you'd imagine, not that far away, there's going to be 1,800 million people that will be living in countries or regions that are suffering from water scarcity. So on the Gold Coast, we're in a pretty wet place. We're serviced by the water grid, so we've got some resilience in our water delivery uh, at a city-wide scale. But in many parts of Australia and many parts of the world, water scarcity is really going to drive some major changes and certainly going to kill a lot of people uh, across the next couple of decades. Now, UN Water has come out and made a lot of statements around what we need to do in terms of managing water. And their strongest statement, I think, is about how we manage our water resources. So improving that water management, 
is really critical to sustainable development in all of its economic, social and environmental dimensions. So that includes us here in a developed country, sitting in a place like Gold Coast. If we don't do a good job of managing our water, all of the gains, all of our livelihoods will be, will be uh, impacted. So if the way I look at climate change adaptation is very much thinking about sustainable development in a changing world, and water is very much central to that. So in terms of what that means for freshwater ecosystems, so the rivers and streams and the, and the uh, groundwater resources that we sit on, we know that there's a lot of services that those healthy environments can provide us. They don't just provide us with water, they can have supporting surfaces in terms of uh, nutrient cycling, trapping certain uh, components of the biogeochemical cycle and turning them over in places where we want those services to happen. They regulate the climate. The heat stress can be influenced by how much water we've got in our landscape. And there's obviously very important cultural services that healthy freshwater ecosystems provide as well. So they're nice places to be around. And the Gold Coast is a water-based city. Everything people really value about this place focuses either on the freshwater environments in the hinterland or the estuarine and marine environments down on the coast. So we need to keep our eye on what we're doing in this watershed, within this catchment area, and what impacts that will have. So with all of this in mind, you might think that we value freshwater ecosystems and we value fresh water really highly. The stats on that are not particularly uh, glowing. Biodiversity of freshwater systems has been degraded more than any other ecosystem on the planet. So between the years of 1970 and 2000, populations of freshwater species on a global scale declined by 55%. So that's far outstripping the declines we'd seen in marine environments and in terrestrial environments. We don't hear about it very often though. How often do we hear about freshwater species decline in the news? Hardly at all, I would say. On top of that, we know that freshwater supports all of the terrestrial biodiversity, so it's not just things that live in water that really rely on the water cycle, it's all of the organisms that are in the terrestrial and those aquatic environments that rely on rainfall. So the take home message here is that we need to preserve healthy freshwater ecosystems because they're critical to our adaptation to climate change. If we've got healthy environments that provide all those provisionings and cultural services that I spoke of on the last slide, we'll be in much better shape to withstand the changes that are going to occur. Now, there's a lot of things we can do at home to conserve water. We can have, uh, we can just operate things slightly differently to ensure that we don't use more water. We can run our washing machines when they're full rather than doing half loads. We can do a lot of recycling, which will reduce the amount of water and energy that we're using. And I'll talk in the workshop about a new recycling program run by a company called TerraCycle and they aim to recycle the unrecyclable unrecy items. So recycling cigarette butts and recycling items that we don't typically put through our recycling streams to conserve water. We can also use biodegradable cleaning products. We can turn off lights and appliances. Anytime we're talking about energy, there's an intimate link with water. We currently don't produce any energy at a great scale that doesn't require some level of use of water. So turning off a light bulb will save us water. And in terms of how much water goes into the production of food, if we skip meat for one meal a week, we'll save a lot of water as well. If you think about how much water goes in to produce a hamburger, about 2,000 litres of water for every hamburger you eat, you can see where the imbalance certainly emerges. So we can talk in the workshop about some of the things you can do at home, but there are also things you can do outside in your neighbourhood, in your community. Planting a tree is already obviously a very good idea and CP and Mark are already on this bandwagon so it's again preaching to the converted but we can also look at the chemicals that run into our waterways so limiting pesticide use is really important. Diversifying your personal water use by capturing water off your roof and using that water for your garden or for your grey uh, water systems is also useful because you're just reducing the demand on that city-wide water system. I'll talk also in our workshop about where you can volunteer to help in stream cleanup or watershed sort of restoration activities, so improving the condition of your local catchments. And really critical, particularly in an area like the Gold Coast, is getting out into the environment and seeing all of the wonderful aquatic environments that we've got in this part of the world. It is a good way of getting people to think about water and value it a bit more. So we should all consider aquatic ecosystems in our adaptation decision making. So beyond just the water focus that I've presented, any action that we do anywhere in a, in a catchment will have watery implications because everything 
ends in the lowest point in the catchment, which is our aquatic ecosystems. So we need to really understand where we sit in the catchment and any activity that we're involved in, how that's going to influence the streams, the rivers, the estuaries and the marine environment that we've got here on the Gold Coast. So just reminding you that that UN water statement about adaptation to climate change really relies on better water management is something that I want you all to take away from today. Before I finish, I just want to also do some spruiking around an app that I've produced, so <laughs> we can all do it. <clears throat> this was an app from a project that was funded by NCARF, so the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility, a few years ago. We wrote this wonderful uh, project report that was 380 pages long, and we recognised very quickly in that piece that no one would re ever read that. So what we wanted to do was turn that report into an app that people could use. We, we were really targeting local people, like all of us here, but also local councils, people that were screaming out to us saying they didn't have enough information to make adaptation decisions. So this app provides climate change projection information. You can plug in your postcode and find out what the projections are looking like for your local area, both in terms of sea level rise and inundation, but also the terrestrial projections around rainfall and temperature and soil moisture. And it also provides information around adaptation actions that will help the local environment withstand some of those climate change impacts. So this is just available for iPhone, iPad at the moment. We're looking at developing it for Android as well. But if you get the chance, download that. It is also free. OK, and that's where I'll leave it today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I would be very, very split on which workshop I'll be going to. Uh, great presentations and uh, WH, mainly known as uh, Dr Wade had one, won the Rapid Stakes, came in at 11 minutes, you beat CP yeah, and JMH. So that was uh, theme um, six, the uh, conservation theme. And we're going to thank our guest speakers with boomerang bags, which is, uh, they're totally made by recyclable materials by a local small business here on the Gold Coast leading the way in that area of uh, climate change adaptation. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, three guest speakers if you'd like to join the audience now, or you can remain there if you like um, to listen to the next presentation. Uh, but thank you very much for that. Um, so, we now go to our theme number eight, uh, which is sustainable tourism. And I'd like to introduce Professor Suzanne Beckin from the School of Tourism here at Griffith University. Um, I'm very proud to be um, introducing so many Griffith University speakers. It really is a cutting edge university in Australia. And I was pleased to have completed my PhD here at Griffith University Gold Coast campus. Um, the opportunity for a mature age student to enter into study and research again was offered to me by the generosity of this university. So I'm really proud that so many of my contemporaries are presenting today. So Professor Suzanne Beckin, um, her background is she's a, a globally recognised expert in the field of sustainable tourism, especially in the areas of climate change, resource management, resilience and environmental behaviours. Her research has been published in more than 100 journals, reports and books, and she has uh, influenced, her research has influenced government policy and industry practice. So would you please welcome Professor Suzanne Beckin. Well, thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone, or maybe we're already in the afternoon, I'm not too sure. Um, and thank you for having me, and thank you for including tourism on the agenda. I'm, I'm very happy about that, because I think tourism can hopefully be part of the solution. Uh, for those people who were here yesterday um, and heard the minister speak, um, you know, you go away from a conference and one line stuck, st uh, sticks in your mind. And for me, it was when the minister said the government is trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions without reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, <laughs> so I've been thinking about that, and that's very reflective of, in fact, even the video we saw this morning. So hopefully, uh, the tourism industry can do a little bit better than that. Um, now, so why are we interested in tourism? And you only have to look outside um, here on the Gold Coast, of course, a lot 
of the activity is about tourism, and we are all living in the middle of it. Um, but in fact, everyone travels. All of us travel um, for various reasons and um, several times a year. And um, because tourism has grown so much around the world, it is now the third largest industry in the world behind automobile and the chemical industry. So it is quite an economic force. Um, to give you just a few numbers for the Australian case, so you get a get a feel for the for the size. Um, about eight million Australians go overseas every year. So that's statistically one in three. There's 80 million domestic trips. So um, there's a lot of travel going on. Um, in turn, we get about 7.7 .7 million international visitors um, who come to Australia. Um, because it's so important to people's lives these days, the United Nations World Tourism Organization talks about the, the right to travel, which, which has been contested by some people. But it is a fact that tourism is often used as a tool for um, whether it's poverty alleviation, development, um, um, stabilization after conflict, or even in Australia, regional development, employment, and so on. So there's a lot of hopes attached to tourism. Um, but there's also a few strings attached, if you want. So one big string has to do with climate change. Um, so how does tourism relate to climate change? Well, the very obvious one, and you can see the picture here from uh, Brisbane Airport, um, um, people disembarking an aircraft. So tourism is a major um, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, um, if you think globally, um, try to estimate um, the amount is about 5% of global emissions are due to tourism. Half of that is from aviation. The other half is all sorts of other activities like taxis and hotels and so on. So it's, it's a major, it's a major, it would be in the top 10 countries of emitters if tourism was a country. Um, at the same time, we, t we tend to put tourism infrastructure into those places that are most vulnerable um, because they are usually the pretty places um, right on the beachfront um, or here this atoll island. So tourism is quite exposed uh, to climate change. Um, and of course it is affected by any climate change policy, whether it's a carbon tax or a disaster act, uh, insurance policies and so on. Okay, so I was told um, by the organizers um, not to talk about problems, only about solutions. So um, <laughs> I'm doing this from here on. Uh, so crisis is an opportunity, we know that. And in fact, um, doing business better is better for business. And there's a lot of research showing that businesses that are engaged in environmental management actually have better financial performance as well. So it makes sense. Usually the smart ones are also doing environmentally better. And you can see a lot of initiatives in tourism um, all over the world um, that try to promote low carbon tourism. So the key is to scale up the good practice, and, and maybe I will finish later with some ideas about step change. Um, okay, so why should tourism decarbonize? Um, so I'll give you a few reasons. Um, one is, um, and that's based on some research I did on hotels in Australia. So the average hotel in Australia basically spends half a million dollar, dollars on electricity. So it's quite a lot, it's quite a cost. So if you can cut that down, it actually has a good business case. Um, especially in the more remote areas um, where many of the tourist infrastructure is located. There's also an increasing demand from the tourists to have sustainable experiences, um, whether they are like slow travel, uh, decelerating life, whether it's um, um, locally produced f uh, f uh, food or whether it's uh, renewable energy, but uh, the demand is there. Um, I always say now tourist wants to be unsustainable. Okay? They may not want to pay more, but every tourist wants to do the right thing. Okay, so I just focus on two things. First, the very obvious energy efficiency is one, and the other one is renewable energy. And so there's all the standards measures, and so I put the light bulbs there. Every hotel should do that. Everyone should do it. Um, and as a rule of thumb, and, and some of the research I've been doing has confirmed that there's a 20% potential to reduce your energy bill, and that, uh, that has been found for homes, for industries. So just by doing the simple things, you can reduce 20%. Now, what about the, the harder bits? So we're talking now about, um, for example, the water energy nexus. And so you see the uh, shower head there. And I've spoken to many environmental managers in hotels and say, have you got low flow shower heads? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so why do you have them? Well, <laughs> it's pretty obvious to save water. And I say, well, now you're actually saving energy. Uh, you're saving more energy in dollar values 
uh, from, from the saving of hot water than the actual water cost. So if you say, oh, okay, I have never thought about that. Um, same with the waste energy ne nexus. So down here you see a little machine um, which is now trialed by a tourist resort in, in Bali, which turns the waste from uh, plastic uh, bottles, the old bottles, into diesel. And it's a machine that um, costs about $1,000 and can, in theory, be in every home. So I'm quite excited about that. So it's first minimizing waste, but whatever you have left, you actually can turn into diesel. So I think that's where the next sort of steps come. Um, this is based on um, about 600 hotels globally. And what I did is look at, um, they're all part of a certification program, so they are leaders. Um, and I looked at how do they improve year on year for different, um, so you've got energy, carbon, water, and waste. And you can see that hotels that are really committed improve in the order of three, four, five percent a year. Um, and so that's probably pretty much the ceiling of what you can achieve. Now that's great, um, but then I thought, okay, hang on, they're actually growing at five or six percent a year. Okay, so we're, we're doing well, but if we think of absolute emissions reductions, we're not doing well enough considering the tourism in Australia, for example, in the moment grows at a rate of 9%. Okay, so we would need to reduce um, consumption by 9% relatively just to stay even. So it's a good start, but not good enough. Okay, just briefly on renewable energy, um, and I put the cover here from, I don't know if you know, if you've seen a few months ago, the Renewable Energy Superpower Report. Um, anyone seen it? No, um, it's an excellent piece. It's basically, it's done by a think tank um, here out of Brisbane, Beyond Zero Emissions. Um, it's a comprehensive <coughs> assessment of Australia's renewable energy potential, and they um, found out that even with very, very conservative assumptions, it's three times the potential of fossil fuels, okay, just for solar and wind, and so they make a case of, of literally becoming um, completely 100% uh, renewable and exporting um, surplus to Indonesia and so on. So it's an excellent report. I really recommend it. Um, yep, thanks. Um, Lady Islet, Elliot Island in the southern Great Barrier Reef is basically self-sufficient. They put a 100 kilowatt solar panel installation there. So it can be done. Um, it can be done. All right. Just a very brief one because I said the, the energy efficiency, renewable energy is the obvious, but I think we can think a little bit more innovative. And thinking tourism is about ob obviously experiencing and it links into the food discussion, for example, cutting supply chains. So why not offer more local food? Why not bring in um, indigenous food, um, which has a lot of win-win, uh, there's employment, um, there's new experiences and, and lower carbon footprint. So I think we can think a little bit outside the box here. Okay, local leaders, um, I won't go through this now, but um, just to show you a few examples of where we have really good um, starting points here on the Gold Coast. And down there is Peter from Lady Elliot Island with the 100 kilowatt. Every tourist resort should have it. Okay, now just briefly on the adaptation side, because I said before tourism is often quite vulnerable, and I think, um, again, crisis is opportunity with the extreme events that tourism, even in, in Queensland in particular, has been experiencing, it's time to think ahead and make tourism businesses more climate proof. So start using seasonal weather forecasts, for example. Agriculture does it. Tourism isn't very really good at it. Um, at the bottom, I, sh I put a, um, there's an app. <laughs> an app for everyone, but I didn't do it. Uh, it was done, it was actually funded by the Australian government specifically for tourism businesses to get the emergency planning ready to prepare for extreme weather events and other crises. It is a very good app, actually. Um, now, a key is, is building design, and I really hope um, we, watch, we watch the building, the construction boom on the Gold Coast. And I do wonder sometimes, I've spoken to a few developers and asked about the sustainability specification and <laughs> um, the answer <laughs> was a little bit like, oh, I'm sure we're covering this. <laughs> so, okay, well, obviously it was in front of mind, but <laughs> I couldn't get more detail. But um, you see an example here, um, if you ever um, go for Abu Dhabi, there's next to, close to the airport, Masta City, which is a, living lab of technology for zero waste, zero water, um, 
100% renewable energy, it's amazing. Um, it shows that it can be done. People live there, there's shops there, and it's, it's all cladded with different solar and so on, and, and they have, of course, very sophisticated modeling. So I would love for this to happen with every new tourist development on the Gulf Coast, which, which there's plenty in the pipeline. Okay, uh, Wade, you talked about water. It's just critical for tourism as well, and that's where everyone, when you go on holiday, of course, you can make a difference. Um, in the way you use water and energy in your room, for example. And um, we did some research um, in Asia Pacific where we looked at water use per guest night in hotels. And it comes as now a surprise that tourists use much more than locals. Um, so even in Australia, Australia and New Zealand are very good compared with some of the other Asian countries, but it's still twice as much as a local would use. Okay, so. Some of that might have to do with cleaning, but it might also be behavior. So I, I still think there's potential. Um, you also see a photo here of South Bank Precinct, uh, which has um, very good um, stuff in terms of re uh, recycled water. Um, so again, I, I don't know if we have that on the Gulf Coast, but it, it would be a very good idea. Okay, oh yeah, I like this. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how you put the washing in, but anyway, I like the idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, just very briefly, I said um, more extreme events. Uh, really, um, it's the worst uh, for a tourist destination if someone dies. Uh, we don't like people dying. It's really bad um, for, for the global image. So, so, so cyclones and all these things are a good time to recheck um, you know, for business, if you have your planning in place, um, every da data is backed up, uh, you know where to put people, you've linked with your emergency services, and so on. Um, you've got a continu can continuity plan. Not every business has it, but the, the more often these things come, the more important it becomes. Just as I said before, tourism can be part of the solution. Um, so, um, Often in, um, maybe not so much on the Gulf Coast, but for example in the Pacific Islands, uh, the, the tourists, is, uh, it's the churches and the hotels that are the most, um, the well-built structures, right? And so, um, some part on, of a project in the Philippines um, called Hotel Resilient, uh, because they found that usually if there's some extreme event, uh, the, the, the one building left standing is the hotel. Okay, they have plenty of food, they have satellite phones, um, they have space, um, so often they're used at ev as evacuation centers. Really important, so um, I think that's, that's quite, it's an important point to then um, connect with the community, and it's happened um, in Fiji, for example, where then after Cyclone Winston, the hotels really get together with the local community to rebuild. Okay, outside the box, just a few slides to finish off what, what's next. Really what I've shown you is just what should be done anyway, okay? They are, they are leading examples, but it's completely feasible and there's no reason why it shouldn't be mainstream. Um, but I'll just show you this one. Um, this is, <laughs> if you know Bedecker, it's uh, one of the leading uh, German guidebook publishers. Um, uh, earlier this year, they published the first uh, renewable energy guide and so when I go to Germany next time, I will buy it. Um, it takes uh, the visitor to all the attractions that have to do with energy, um, new stuff, interesting like retired nuclear power plants that have turned into a theme park, all these things. Um, now I feel because I don't have an app for the Gulf Coast, um, <laughs> I feel we should develop something like this, like sustainable attractions or experiences on the Gulf Coast, but I think it's a brilliant idea um, to educate people through tourism. Um, I also mentioned about building design. There's so much new technology into passive design and so on that I really think we need to do a bit better. Um, and I love this one. Um, <laughs> for all of us who like going to the mountains, uh, this is apparently, um, <laughs> apparently you can carry it, Jean-Marc, you can put it in your, your backpack. <laughs> and <laughs> so maybe you can have your lab up there in the mountains. Um, it falls together and it's got a solar panel and a little windmill. Um, anyway, and of course we have future transport, which is in the end where the carbon emissions really sit for tourism. So we, we talk about um, self-drive ports, battery, um, blended wing design for aviation. So uh, that's, that's the space to watch. Um, there is a workshop. Um, Dr. Pascal Scherer up here and Dr. Alexandra Coughlin uh, will, uh, yeah, here, will uh, lead the workshop if you want to discuss more about sustainable tourism on the Gulf Coast. So thank you, everyone.
Terrific. Thank you very much. That was uh, Professor Suzanne Beckin. Um, we're going to move into workshop time. And uh, in terms of the workshops, I'll announce the coloured uh, animals that you have to follow to get to your workshops. Whatever happens, we will be coming back for lunch at 10 past 1 p.m.